So I uh, just want to welcome you here today uh, and Pastor Errol and Sue send you their love. They're on leave uh, doing an amazing trip and uh, we might just pray for them, hey? Father, we just thank you for our senior pastors, Errol and Sue Buckle. They're such a blessing to our heart, Father. We just pray for your protection over them as they travel and as they rest and rejuvenate. We pray, Lord, that they would have an amazing time and that they would come back refreshed. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Um, so, yeah, for the, uh, the next five weeks, years, I've got some different people preaching. Uh, I've got a couple of messages. Brenda's got one and Pastor Ian from Jinjin is going to come over and uh, share with us as well. We're so blessed, church, to have such a wealth of people in our fellowship. And um, it's so exciting that Pastor Errol and Sue can take time and to re, re, uh, refresh and to take time to be blessed. That we can bless them as a church to send them off without fear of the church falling apart. God is so much bigger than that, isn't he? Um, anyway, today uh, I want to talk to you about I have decided to follow Jesus. That's the name of my message. I want to look at some uh, stages of discipleship. And um, that's what this uh, song uh, represents. It, if you're a um, person who's been around church circles for any number of years, maybe you can remember the old anthem that we used to sing years ago, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. It was uh, made famous through uh, a lot of the uh, evangelistic gospel crusades like uh, Billy, Billy Graham and uh, people like that. But it talks about um, stirring up the things of God and going in for something deeper in the, in the things of the spirit. And that really is my heart for you this morning, church, that you wouldn't be content with sitting where you are in God, but that you'd be stirred to press in and to look for something more, because that's one of the amazing things about our faith, is that we don't have to settle in a rut, we don't have to get stuck and think, oh, well, this is it for me, I made a decision back in 1973, <laughs> and that's all there is for me. No, God has so much more for you. And um, he can excite you about your faith. He can lead you and continue to teach you. And there is always something more that you can glean. There's always something extra that you can grab a hold of. One of the, uh, one of the challenges when you're preparing a message for church is that you're faced with people on all different parts of the spectrum of their journey of faith. And uh, some people are just new to church and they don't sort of know much about the, the weird Christianese sort of words that we use sometimes and we, we don't even think that people who are new don't even understand what we're talking about. And then there's people at the other end of the spectrum who may have been disciples of Jesus for many years and even decades. And... Um, they have such a rich experience of God's faithfulness over many, many, many years. And then there's everybody else in between those two, uh, two points. So um, one, one of the good things about uh, Kids Church is that we can tailor the message depending on what the age group is. We've, got the, we've separated things into the three different age groups. And obviously the Busy Bees... Even though they're learning the same story, they don't get the same message as what we give down in Eagles. You can tailor it to that audience. But in church, we, we don't have that luxury. We've got to try and give you a bit of a shotgun blast <laughs> and hope some of it sticks. But I, I really want to focus in today on uh, discipleship and show you that um, we, we're going to... Um, teach you a little bit about it first from our passage in Mark chapter 8 and then I'm going to give you four 
levels of um, discipleship or four levels of our spiritual journey as, as we grow in God. So if you've got your Bibles, uh, I'd encourage you to turn to Mark chapter 8. And um, it says there uh, in verse 27, And Jesus went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. Now, uh, maybe you're not familiar with that particular area or that, those, those villages in uh, Israel. And you might just skip over that bit because um, there's so many weird place names in the Bible and it's hard to get a, get a hold on every, every little place. But one thing that was unique about that area is it was known for its pagan worship and for its... Um, it was a bit of a wild place to be. That was actually where the, there was a cave and there was... A, uh, natural spring that would come out of it. It w- was actually known as the Gates of Hell. I think when Pastor Shane Willard was here, he showed us some photos of it. And you can actually still, uh, if you visit Israel today, you can go to those sites and there's still remnants of those pagan altars. But it it was a bit of a wild place and it was like Jesus was taken to this place. He, he was like taking them to Vegas. <laughs> It was like, it wasn't a, a sedate place. It was a place of pagan worship. So it's, it's in the northeastern part of Israel, near the Golan Heights. And if you do a tour to modern Israel today, like I say, there, you can see some of the, the uh, remnants of the place. Now, Jesus had a lot of options here. He could have taken them to some of the more scenic uh, places in his ministry, like around the uh, Sea of Galilee, it's very peaceful, and um, he could have done that, but he didn't. He uh, he said, "Come on, guys, we're going to Caesarea Philippi," and uh, he was basically saying, "Look, guys, I want I want to show you something. Let me offer you all that the world has to offer." He was bringing them to a decision point. And he, he wasn't doing that in the luxury of their synagogue or in their church. Anybody can say yes to Jesus when you're hearing holy, 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 when, when the band is playing and you, you feel the presence of God in the, in the house. You've got the worship team up here doing an amazing job, lifting up the name of Jesus. Jesus didn't, didn't do that. He brought them out into the place of the world, into a place of pagan worship. And he was saying, okay, what do you really want? What do you want now? Is this what you want? And on the way to there, he, he, he spoke to them and he, he started to ask them, who, who do people say that I am? Just as he's saying... This morning, who, who do people say that I am? Who, who do you think Jesus is to you? Some of the people said, oh, in verse uh, 20, 28, it says, and they replied, some say John the Baptist. And at this point, John the Baptist had actually been beheaded a few weeks earlier, so it would have been pretty fresh. But... In those times, in that culture, there was a, a strong reincarnation sort of a, a thing that they had going on there. So that, that was one of the answers that came back. Some others said Elijah. Because it says in the, uh, the Old Testament that Elijah was going to come back. Other people, again, said Still others, you're just, you're just one of the prophets. You're pretty good at explaining things, Lord. Your teaching is pretty good, but that's, that's about it. And then he says, what I'm saying to you now, what about you? I really want you to think about this this morning. What and who is Jesus to us personally? And... 
Is he where he needs to be? It's a simple question, but only we can answer it individually. And I, w- I want to lead you to that decision this morning. Who do you say that he is? Peter pipes up and he says, oh, Lord, you're the Messiah. And um, before you think too highly of him, he, he was thinking in terms of, um, he wasn't thinking in terms of faith or in spiritual terms or religious terms. He was thinking of political and governmental reasons. The Jews had been governed by the Romans for quite a, quite a long time at that point. Before that, it was the, the Greeks, and before that, it was the, the Babylonians and the Assyrians. They had been a conquered people for a long time. And they'd been longing for hundreds of years to, for this, this Messiah who had been foretold of, that he was going to come and deliver them. But they were thinking in, in terms of an earthly king, not, not a heavenly king. So they were excited, thinking, oh, we're finally going to be in charge of our own, own government for the first time in years. But Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. because he knew that they weren't thinking of him in the, in the right terms. So he began to teach the crowd in verse 31. It says, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders. He started to describe his, his death. The chief priests and the teachers of the law that he must be killed and after three days rise again. Then Peter piped up again and he said, no, no, Lord, this, this isn't the plan. He spoke plainly to them. And I sort of I love this bit because it, it shows like Peter is such an amazing character. One minute he's saying, no, Lord, you're the Messiah. And then the next minute he's taking Jesus aside and he's rebuking him. He's taking God aside. What sort of guts would you have to have to be able to do that, to take God aside and to try and give him a few pointers? <laughs> he knows who Jesus is and yet he's still trying to steer him in his own way. But I'd just like to point out that he began to rebuke him, he says. He didn't get very far. Jesus turned and looked at the disciples and he rebuked Peter and he said this, and this is really important. I just want you to brace yourself because he, it, it's pretty full on. He says, he rebukes Peter in verse 33. Get behind me, Satan, he said. How would you like to be called Satan <laughs> by the senior pastor? Satan, get out of here. <laughs> It'd be a bit hard to take, wouldn't it? He said, you do not have the mind in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. He was saying to Peter, you've got a demonic mindset right now. What what is a demonic mindset? Well, Jesus defines it simply as you don't have the mind of the concerns of God. You're only thinking about your human concerns. You're only thinking about yourself. Let me put it a different way. Sometimes people think that Christianity is, well, I get to live my life and uh, I want God to bless it and then give me a place in heaven when this is all over. But I've got every intention of just living my own way. But I still want you to bless me, Lord, and I need you to be there for me. If something goes wrong, Jesus is saying, no, that's not how it really is. I'm not here to be here for you. You're there to be there for me. You need to have the concerns of God. It gets deeper when we uh, go a bit further. He goes on to um, address the disciples in verse 34. Then he called to the crowd 
to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must. And I haven't finished that verse there on the, the slide because if you're going to call yourself a Christian or a follower of Christ, um, now maybe you've been in church for a while and you know what it continues on to say, but maybe many of you don't know what it says. What, what does it mean to be a disciple of Christ? You would think it would be things like lift your hand. I see that hand. If you want to be a disciple, lift your hand. Fill out the card. Join a church. Grab yourself a Bible. You'd think it'd be one of those, but it's much deeper than that. And this is what I'm trying to clarify for us this morning since the one that we say that we serve says this, and if you really are serious about being a disciple, you need to deny yourself. He says, anyone who wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. So we see that that bit there where it talks about the cross and we're like, okay, well, I, I like that. that that's, that's great. Because in our culture, the cross has been stylized and it's been, uh, we've got like a, a font version of it in our mind. <laughs> it's very um, sanitized and uh, we, we put them on our buildings, we stick them on our jewelry. When we think of crosses, we think of things like hospitals or charities that help people. It's a symbol of faith and of uh, spirituality, but in their culture, the cross didn't mean any of those things. In Roman times, the cross was a place of execution. It was where criminals were taken to die. If we were to wear something like that on our jewellery, it would be like wearing a a guillotine on a necklace or an electric chair. It's a bit of a different symbol, isn't it, to what we're, we're, we're thinking of. Jesus was saying, I'm going to take you to a place where everything dies and is executed and I want you to follow me if you want to be one of my disciples. Whoever wants to save his life, so if you're saying, it's not for me, I've, I've got plans, I've got an agenda, that's way too much God for me. <laughs> well then, it go, he goes on to say that you're going to lose it anyway. Verse 35, whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. For what good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their own soul? Or can anyone give an exchange for their soul? He's saying that you don't understand that if you reject this, you're losing it and you're still going to die. The Bible tells us that it's appointed once for a man to, to die and then comes the judgment. It's one of the constants in life. We all die at some point. But we need to make sure that we've invested enough on the other side so that when we get to that point, we're a disciple of Christ. My aim isn't to see how much of this earth I can suck out of the earth I'm going to live for you and for the gospel, he says. If we live for him, then we will find life and life more abundantly. We won't know it unless we try it. We won't know what's on the other side of it unless we jump in on the other side and you see that it actually saves your life. It's going to save your marriage. It's going to save your joy. It's going to save your happiness. It's going to save your dream. Sometimes people think, oh, if I, if I give everything to God, if I give up my ambition to God, if I 
live my life for God. I'm going to be forced to be a missionary to some little hole of a place and I'm never going to have any little fun in my life. <laughs> but God knows the desires of our heart. He knows where we're at and he knows what excites us. So when we give ourselves over to him, he gives us a life that is more full than we could have ever imagined by ourselves. We're not going to hate it. We're going to love it. When he says, um, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him Ashamed of them when he comes in his father's glory with the holy angels. So he says, if you're ashamed of me and my words, it's like if this bugs you, he calls us an adulteress. You know what an adulteress is? It's it's someone who's married but loves something else. He's saying that it, you're in this family, but you're actually loving some, something else. He calls it a wicked and sinful generation. And the Son of Man, if that happens, he'll be ashamed of us when he comes in his Father's glory with his holy angels. Everything about me does not want that to happen to any of you here this morning, church. I don't want for you to get there to that place And to look back on your walk with God and realise, you know what? There should have been more that I I could have done and experienced with God. What I want to do with you this morning is to invite you on that journey. What I love about this journey is that everybody in this room, no matter where they're at, they're in a different place in their faith journey. But some people in the room are listening to me right now. Maybe you're not even a Christian, and there's others of, of us who've, who've known the Lord for, for years. They know the scriptures, they have a mature faith, they've got a solid work with God. The challenge is that we've got to take us all on this journey and help everybody to take their next step. The only way that I could think of to, sh- to do that was to show you the full spiritual continuum and to show how Jesus had that same continuum of people that he dealt with and how he challenged them. So I'm going to finish with four levels or stages of spiritual development. And what I want you to do is to find yourself on that scale and just simply ask yourself whether you're willing to get to that next level and into the next one. The first level is the crowd. Come and see. Maybe you're brand new to church and you're part of the, the, just the, the crowd. The message to the crowd is, hey, just, just come and see. We're not telling you to, to give. We're not telling you to, that you've got to serve. We're not trying to force anything. We're, we don't have an ulterior motive. You don't have to buy into all of this. You don't have to believe the Bible or even believe what I'm saying is true. Just come. The psalmist said it this way. He said in Psalm 34, verse 8, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Just come and see. So Jesus Jesus had crowds, you know that. By what we read from the, the Gospels, he had piles of people who followed him. And they always followed him for things that he would give them. Feed me. <laughs> I mean, we're starving, Lord. So he he got the loaves and the fishes. It was like happy meals for everybody. And so then he he just he healed people before they even became his followers. They they didn't have to do anything before he he healed them. He he found random people and healed them. And so that drew a crowd of people. And to the crowd, he was saying, I'm not telling you, you have to choose anything now. Just come and see. And we do that today. Here at Heritage, if you're part of Heritage, you know that we create certain environments that are just crowd-type environments. 
when, where we're not necessarily asking anything of the people who come along. We're just trying to expose them to the gospel message and to give them a, a positive experience. If you came to one of our Christmas musical performances last year, we had a, a packed house. Most of the nights that we, we performed the musical and we had to put out extra chairs. But that's not, um, that's not how many will be here today. And what, why is that? That's, that's because it was a special, non-threatening event that allowed people to invite their non-church friends to, where some people uh, got in the room because the dance items or the musical performances or the drama or the comic relief allowed people to take that next step and to see, uh, to have the opportunity to see if they were ready to take another step towards God. We intentionally create crowd moments, but check this out. A, a crowd doesn't make a church and the crowd doesn't even make a follower of Christ. But you're still welcome. If you're part of the crowd, you're welcome in this place. We've been coming to Heritage since we moved to Bundaberg back in 1998. And so we've been at Heritage for 25 years this year. And when I was reflecting on that, preparing this message, I was thinking back over the many years of all the different amazingly creative crowd events that Heritage has put on during that time. We've seen Christmas musicals, we've seen kids' musicals, we've seen fashion parades, we've seen changing rooms, <laughs> we've seen family fun days, concerts, dramatic performances. I can remember when Hell's Gates and Hell Heavens no <laughs> Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames came and the whole uh, church was that wall was all glittery, silvery stuff and it was pretty full on. <laughs> we've had concerts, we've had dramatic performances. One year we even had a rodeo. We've had uh, big splash events at the Norval Pool for uh, youth groups all across the region. One year we even did a, an event called Christmas Alive, which was like a a smaller version of what we do with Bethlehem Live. There, we moved all the chairs out of the auditorium and we replaced it with uh, some temporary walls that had murals painted on them. And each of the, uh, the rooms had, it was like a maze where you had to walk through and each room was a different chapter in the Christmas story with live actors and um, all in period costume and... Those actors, they performed time and time after, like each new group of people that came through for the night, they just performed all night. It was a mammoth effort, but it was a fully immersive telling of the, the Christmas story that we were able to do for our community so that people could hear the message. There was no pressure. And it's the same this morning. There's, there's no pressure this morning. I'm not trying to pressure anybody into anything. I just want you to make sure that you know what your next steps are. And if you're like me, you want to be a fully devoted follower of Christ. And that's what we want for you. We don't just want just a little bit of the good stuff. We want it all for you so that you can fulfill your full potential in him. He has so much for us. But some of us are still at that beginning stage. And that's okay. You're welcome in this place. But the second stage in our growth and in our development spiritually is that of family. Come and join us. Like a family, like, just like in a family, and anybody who's ever gotten married and better yet, has had kids, families have benefits, but they also have responsibilities. When you um, start your family, you realise, oh, I'm in a family now. <laughs> it, 
It changes your perspective of how you look at things and how you do things. You can't just uh, do things however you feel like. You've got responsibilities. Like if you're a guest and you come over to our house for dinner, you don't have to cook dinner. You just knock on the door. We let you in. We, we, we serve you uh, dinner and then you go home. And we, uh, we stay there and we wash the dishes after you've gone. And why, why is that? Because we're in the family. You are a guest. And at that first stage, when you're a guest, that's okay. But the family has a place of responsibility. But it also has perks. There are benefits to being in a family. You get the benefit of family. You get the joy of walking together. When you're in a family, you don't have to go through anything alone. You've got people who will stick with you through thick and thin. They will support you through the challenges of life. And when you join the family, there, there are two levels to joining the family of God. And the first one isn't necessarily Heritage Christian Centre, by the way. The most important family is the family of God. And when you become a Christian, you're first and foremost becoming part of the family of God. This is an amazing benefit because no matter where you go, you are part of that family of God. No matter where you end up in life, you can go to your local church and they will accept you as part of the family of God whether you were originally from that church or not. Our family immigrated here from Scotland back in the early 70s and part of that was that we didn't have a lot of extended family here in Australia but because we were part of the family of God, they became our family and were able to stand in the gap um, and that, that was a, a great consolation to us as a family. John 1 verse 12 says, But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God, to be in the family. He gave us the right to be part of his family. It's always such a blessing to see people getting saved at church and publicly declaring that they're part of the family of God. And maybe you're here this morning and you need to take that step you need to become a family member, not to heritage, but to the family of God. You need to say, oh, I want him to be my father. I want to be in this family. I want all the responsibilities and the, and the benefits. And by the way, if you're at that level or that stage in your journey, I'm inviting you into that. Later this morning, we'll give you that opportunity to accept Jesus as your saviour, as your Lord. Maybe today you'll take that next step to follow Jesus with all your heart. The first thing that he, when you do that, one of the first things that Jesus asks us to do is to be water baptised. Oftentimes people make a decision to follow Jesus and it's a private decision. Sometimes we might say with every head bowed or every eye closed and that's because it's a decision between you and God. We're not trying to embarrass anybody or manipulate anyone. But the Bible says that he wants us to acknowledge that decision to the rest of the world. And he says, I want you to publicly declare your faith. And the method that he, he chooses to declare it is through baptism. If you've never been biblically water baptised, I'd encourage you to consider it. And what, what I mean by that is a believer's baptism that you've deliberately chosen to do after you've made a decision to follow Jesus. If you've been christened in another church as an infant, I'm not trying to undo any of your childhood experiences because those memories are beautiful, but they're de dedicatory. When you are christened or dedicated, that's a decision that your parents make you don't have a say in that but when you 
um, baptised by full immersion after you've become a Christian. That's a decision that you take yourself. And if you've never taken that step, I'd encourage you, don't, don't be shy. You can be baptised by filling out an expression of interest form at our info desk. We've got an awesome font built right into the stage here. And uh, we, we do baptisms right throughout the year. Whenever somebody wants to be baptised, we make sure that it's included as part of our service on a Sunday morning. And it is really powerful when you hear people's testimonies of how God has changed and transformed their life and they're making that public declaration. So when we become Christians, we become part of the family of God, firstly, but secondly, if you become a Christian here at Heritage, you you also become part of the Heritage family. And this is so important in that you need to be planted in a home church. And Heritage is a great church, but it, it's not the only church in town. It's not the only great church. There are many great churches in our city. And oftentimes we'll join together and do combined events throughout the year to support SU Chappies and the amazing work that they do, or through events like uh, Bethlehem Live that we're doing at Christmas time. But it's good to have a home church where you're planted and you're under that authority. It's good to find a family and to be faithful to that family, to be good and to support your family, to give and to serve and be part of that family. And if you would like to get a feel for this heritage family, I'd recommend that you do the the DNA course with Pastor Errol. He runs it a, a number of times each year. I think it's each quarter he does it. It only goes for a couple of uh, nights, but it tells you all about the history of the church and the DNA of our culture. One final thing before we move to the next level is that if we are family, we need to be consistent in our attendance. One of the greatest gifts that my parents gave to me was that we very rarely miss church. It was part of the rhythm of our life. We didn't go and do other things on a Sunday if we could help it. We didn't have weekends off. We didn't wake up in the morning and say, do you want to go today? (laughs) That wasn't even a question. We knew that we were going. It was a given. And why is it so important to build that discipline into your life? It's because we need to pass on our faith to the next generation. We need to instill that into the fabric of our routine. The next generation is under a barrage of attack from our enemy, the devil, and this is our responsibility. I know there are times when you can't make it in person to church due to work, shifts or through sickness or other factors and that that's okay like it's not a legalism thing but we shouldn't let it become our default where we're governed by our emotions whether or not we go we go because we're family the other week we watched um brenda and i watched a documentary on the blue zones and um This was a really interesting uh, show that was looking at a study that was examining the blue zones around the world. And if you don't know what that is, there's there's five or six areas where people live to over 100 years old and they've got the highest quality of life. And they were talking about all the factors that were involved in that and the things that contributed to them living so long. And, of course, they talked about their diet and other factors but one of the things that they had in common in every blue zone every single one of them one of the things that people in blue zones do is go to church every Sunday this wasn't a Christian show this was a just a secular documentary but they said that you can actually add 8 to 14 years of your life if you go to church every Sunday or are engaged in a community of faith where you are participating and engaged. 
So I just want to encourage you this morning, don't let your emotions drive whether or not you go to church. Just go. If you're available, just go. Let it become part of the pattern of your life. And that brings us to our third level of growth, a third level on our spiritual journey. And we're going to dig a little bit deeper. It's what Jesus calls a disciple. If I can just ask the musicians and the singers to come back, we're going to wind this up soon. But the message for this level, disciple, is come and grow. Don't just join a family. Don't just join the family. I want for each person here who's part of the family, every year that you're here, I want you to be a little bit more mature, a little bit better at making decisions. I want you to see progress in your reading of the the word of God, a little bit better in your prayer life. I want you to see like less habits that are destructive in your life. Not perfect, but better. There's always areas where we can make changes. The thing I'm asking you this morning, if you're at this stage, if you're part of the family, are you growing? I just want to challenge you. Are you growing? It's easy to put on a, an image or a face at, at church on Sunday and to make it look like you've got it all together. But only you really know if you're growing. When was the last time you stepped out of your comfort area? When, when was the last time you allowed God to stretch you or to challenge you? You need to know that the intention of Christianity isn't just to get you to heaven one day in the distant future. The intent of Christianity is for you to become mature in your faith, to bring transformation to your life here and now. The Bible describes it this way. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 16, it says, Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors, and the teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until all such until all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's son that we will be mature in the lord measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ then there will be no longer we will no longer be immature like christian like children there's hope for us all we'll no longer be immature like children Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. And as each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts to grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. That's my heart for you this morning, church, that you would continue to grow and be full of love. That you would continue to mature and to overcome any challenges that are faced in your way. God will give you the victory. He'll give you the tools that you need to overcome. He'll give you strategies. So how do we do that? How do we grow? Well, we lead you in spiritual disciplines and that's why at the start of each year we we start with a, a week of prayer and fasting. That's why at the start of each month we have a, a night of prayer and praise. That's why we organise women's conferences and men's conferences and girls' nights out. That's why we have connect groups. That's why we lead connect groups. It's because it's a time where we can grow. We need to grow, church. If there's life, there will be growth. 
when we stop to when we stop growing that's when we stagnate that's when we get in a rut but it doesn't have to be like that now if you're not in the family yet if you're just part of the crowd that's not your decision yet your decision is to just get in the family but if you are in the family you need to grow if you're already growing it's time for you to minister and that brings us to our fourth level the fourth level of growth on our spiritual journey is to minister to come and serve there's a large number of people in our church who are already serving or ministering in some capacity and these are people who take their faith so seriously that they want to share what God has done by serving the family on the music team or on the production team I better pull that back a bit so it doesn't fall off serving on the host roster or as a connect group leader by serving at youth on a Friday night maybe they're on the kids ministry team or on the platinums or nexus teams because they understand this thing doesn't just exist for me I'm not a spectator I'm a participant I'm a player in the game so this morning if you're in the family I'm inviting you to come down out of the grandstands. Get in the game. Find out how much it is, how much fun it is to play the game. In John 15 verse 8, Jesus said, This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. If we're his disciples, we will bear fruit. In order for that to happen, there's got to be growth. Now, what makes all four of those stations, stages possible? You're not going to like it. But I'm just going to tell you. I'm going to close with this one little phrase and then we're done. But it is required and it is painful. But you will love what's on the other side of it, I promise you. And that is the real message of the Bible is... Come and die. Die to your habits, die to your dreams, die to your old agenda, die to your will, die to your old way of thinking. Because I've decided I'm going to follow Jesus. And I'm not living for me, I'm going to live for Jesus. I'm going to live for His kingdom come, His will be done. And if I do that, I'm going to find the best part of life and that's my guarantee to you as scary as it might seem you're going to love what you get on the other side because he knows the desires of our heart Galatians 2 20 says I've been crucified with Christ and no longer live but Christ lives in me the life I now live in the body I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you for this message. I pray that we would be challenged and that we would grow. Lord, I just ask you right now in the beauty of this holy moment, God, there are decisions being made today whether we're in the crowd and we're just coming and seeing, whether we're in the family. Whether we're a disciple and we we're we're growing, or whether we're ministers and we're here to serve. If we're gonna take us our faith seriously, not just Tick a box on Sunday and then live the rest of the week like it doesn't even matter. No, Jesus, we've decided to follow you. No turning back. 
No turning back. Now with heads bowed and eyes closed, this is that private moment I was telling you about before. It's just between you and God. I'm not going to have you stand up or come to the front. But if you're here today and you're saying, it's time, I need to go all in with God. Or maybe you're here this morning and you are a Christian, but you know you haven't really been taking your faith seriously. You've just been coasting along. But today you're ready to be a follower of Jesus. Maybe you're here today and you're not even a Christian, but you're ready to jump into the family of God. I want to invite you this morning. The Bible says, just confess with your mouth that He's your Lord and believe in your heart that you'll be saved. I want to lead you through that confession this morning, right now, here this morning, where you're seated. If you want to be a part of that confession, I want you to pray this prayer up to heaven. Jesus, you gave me your life. Today I give you mine, everything. I come and die, ask you to forgive my sins. Come into my life and be raised from the dead. And today I put my faith in you. I'm going to live my life for you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've prayed that prayer this morning for the first time, that's between you and God. But we would love to encourage you. So come and speak to us. We've got some info packs that we can give you. As the worship team just sings this last song, we're going to open the altar. If anybody needs prayer, the, worship, the ministry team is here. We're happy to pray with you. Thanks, team.